Hello, I'm going to look at the cycling of heat pumps here, which is switching on and off. And it's a normal way of controlling or limiting the output. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And it's and maybe it should be expected. But I noticed some people trying to avoid it at all costs. And that may not necessarily be a good plan. So I'm going to look at some monitor graphs here of some operating heat pumps and just comment on some of the better and not so good examples. Now I put the term short cycling and short cycling is really a term used when, when we're in sort of fault condition. Usually it's a big waste of energy and probably causing wear and tear. So let's get, let's get started. So here we have a sort of overview of what we mean by cycling. This is a, a one day graph of a system being monitored. And we're only showing here the, the flow temperature out of the heat pump and the electrical power input. Now, what I'm, I'm showing here with the green line is when the room thermostat is calling for heat. This is due to one or more thermostats asking the heat pump to run. And we can see at the end period here, that it's cycling on and off on the heat pumps cut out. So the thermostat is enabled all the time, is on all the time. The heat pump is getting up to a flow temperature of 45 and turning on and off. At the early, earlier period, the heat pump keeps running. And this will be because there's more load, there's more radiators or more underfloor loops in circuit. Now with a boiler, we're more used to a thermostat switching on and off more regularly. In other words, the temperature is satisfied quite easily because they're fairly high output. But with a heat pump, the output will be lower. The temperature of the radiator will be lower. And it's quite likely to hover below the setting of the thermostat, which is fine. So that's just a general over, overview. Now let's look at some specific details. I'm first going to look at a ground source heat pump. I'm just showing the diagram so then you get a better idea of actually what, what I'm talking about. The next graph shows this system being monitored. And it's an old uh, ground source heat pump. And it's very simple. And all we're monitoring is the flow temperature to the underfloor heating and the return back from the underfloor heating and the electrical input to the system. This is just showing the ground loop temperature, but I'm not showing that on this graph. And this is a, a graph generated over about 12 hour period. So just to recap, there's temperature on this scale and um, power in watts, input power on, on this scale. We can see that the compressor or well, the system starts at this point here. The power jumps up to just over a kilowatt. And as that happens, the flow temperature rises up. And shortly after, the return starts to rise as well. And we've got this long period of four or five hours where the flow and return are rising nicely in parallel, about five degrees difference, five degrees delta T across the flow and return. And during this period, of course, the floor screed is, is warming up and heat is being delivered to the to the building. Ignore these little um, blips, which are a very brief hot water cylinder heating. Now, what I've added here are an estimate of what the COP will be. This is the energy efficiency, the ratio of the heat output to the power input at these operating temperatures. So the efficiency as the water temperature rises will be dropping because the, the temperature is rising and a little bit harder work for the heat pump. See, this is how I estimated the COP variation with the dropping the temperature by two and a half degrees. This is something which is quite useful actually on my website up here. You can put in the flow temperature on the hot side and the source temperature. And this uses the Carnot COP equation to estimate what the COP might be. And whilst that isn't particularly accurate, uh, it's not that bad, but it's quite good at, at showing the variation. So in this case, we're looking at a ground source heat pump that's probably evaporating. The refrigerant is probably evaporating at around about zero. And if the flow temperature is about 29.5, we're getting a COP of just over four and a half. And if we drop this down by two and a half degrees, the COP goes up to almost five. So it's about 8% better, which is a reasonable amount. What I'd like to look at is this, what actually happens when it starts to cycle, because at this point here, the return temperature has got to the setting of the heat pump and it's decided to stop because there's enough heat being delivered to the floor. 
So it stops for about 35 minutes or so. You can see the flow and return temperature come together. So we know the circulation pump is still running. We can see that on the wattage down here. And then after a certain time, it's dropped to whatever the value is. And then it starts up again and it runs again for another 40 minutes or so. Now, the actual temperature of which the heat pump sort of sees, the, the, the water going through the heat pump, is rising up from about 27 and a half up to about 31 or so. So I reckon the average temperature that the heat pump is seeing is about 29 and a half. So let's look at what actually is being delivered to the floor. Because the floor is not only getting this bit, but it's also getting this bit. It's still flowing. The water's flowing to the floor, rising up to about 31 and right down to, oh, 23 or so. So the average temperature the floor is getting is about 27 degrees. So instead of actually pulsing on and off and operating here, we could, if we could reduce the power of the compressor, we should be able to operate at about 27 degrees steady state because we'd still be getting the same amount of heat into that floor. And I'm showing that here. I've just drawn in. Instead of the heat pump cycling on off about 50 50 here, if we can halve the power input, run in steady state, then the flow temperature should be somewhere in around 27 degrees. And because the heat pump is, is seeing a lower temperature, we should get a better COP, meaning, in fact, this is a bit less than half. So there's a saving being made. Now, I've, I've done this estimate here on the COP. So I'm suggesting that whilst if we operate here in cycles, the average COP might be 4.56. Don't get hung up on the decimal points. This is approximate. But if we can operate down at 27, the COP should increase to about 4.94, which I think is about 8% improvement. So this is really what inverter variable speed heat pumps do. They drop the flow temperature. That's one of the main advantages so that the COP can be a bit better. So what I'm suggesting here is when you have cycling, there's always the opportunity to avoid it and run at a lower temperature, but that does depend on the, equi the, the equipment can do that and is going to operate efficiently at that lower temperature. I've just added this in. For those of you wondering about ground source heat pumps and, and them running continuously as opposed to cycling, because there's a feeling that there needs to be some rest time for the ground source to recover, uh, I like this graph. It's quite interesting. It's an inverter ground source heat pump, which is running non-stop for the whole of the winter there for three months, I think. This is the power input, which is varying a little bit from time to time. But the, the ground source doesn't get below six. But there's no problem there running at, at steady state. It's a matter of the ground loop being big enough for the the heat quantity that's been taken off. So here's an example where cycling doesn't seem to be a problem. This is actually Glyn Hudson's air source heat pump. And I've just zoomed in on a little section here. And it's showing several cycles over a half hour period and also a steady state section after that. So we're using a heat meter, class two heat meter. It's always good to question accuracy of measuring. And of course, with stopping and starting so frequently, we're not exactly sure how quick how quickly the sensors pick up the temperature changes. So there could be a little bit of error here, but generally over with multiple readings, they should sort of cancel each other out. So to assess this, Tristan Lee has added an interesting little facility on this and what he's done he's taken the input wattage and worked out what heat output we should be getting with the the COP that these temperatures should give us and that's this overlay here and as we can see that there's not much difference at all between the period of steady state and the period of cycling 
We can also actually zoom in and get the reading off the stats. And when I did that, it seemed that the steady state period was just slightly better than the cycling. But really, given it's only 3% difference, it's hard to be accurate here, but certainly there's no big problem with this cycling here. Now let's look at one, one factor is when a system starts up. So this is an air source heat pump. The period here is about an hour, so it's about four hour total period. This is a system starting from cold. And at this point here, we can see the flow and return temperatures are around 20 degrees. Now, what I've done is I've added the COP, this line here, which is simply this output, heat output, divided by the power input. So it's an instantaneous COP, which of course goes off the scale here, but that's to be expected. As it starts up, we can see the heat output rises considerably and the COP is really high. It's five and a half there. But that is to be expected because the water temperature is about 20 degrees and the outside temperature is five degrees. And as these temperatures build up and rise up to about 35, we can see a general decline in the COP. And that's what we'd expect. And it gets right down to a COP of four here. It's quite e interesting just to go off on a little tangent here. This is actually a, a fairly old heat pump. Although this isn't relevant to cycling here, I can't resist just looking at this because it controls really nicely. What happens here is something turns off because the flow rate drops down. So hence the flow and return temperature rise. And as that happens, the power input halves, as does the heat output. But we can see that the COP is fairly stable. The, the ratio of the heat output and the power input is stable. And then at this point here, for some reason, something opens up, the temperatures drop and the power input goes up and so does the heat output and the COP jumps up as well. Interesting to note how the COP is fairly constant there. And we get to this point here, which is also just for interest, it does a defrost. So the flow temperature, rather than being above the return, drops down, goes down to almost 20 degrees, actually. We've got negative heat here. So it's taking a little bit of heat out of the out of the house but it's, and melting the ice build up on the evaporator outside. And after about four minutes, it has a little rest and then it restarts and then the COP is restored up there. Anyway, sorry about that little tangent. So this is the cold start, the advantage of starting when it's cold. But if we look at this one, it shows something else, which is in a way countering that. It's the, as a system starts up, the COP takes a little while to establish. Now, in the times when expansion valves were mechanical, as almost all fixed speed heat pumps are, then when the, when the system stops, the valve closes. As it starts up, the valve has to open up and sort of find its best position to control the refrigerant. And that takes a little while. So there's some swings in pressures while that happens, which inevitably results in a little bit of a reduction here. Now, with a inverter heat pump, which has an electronic expansion valve, it closes when it stops, but at startup, it makes a sort of best guess at where it wants to be. So actually, they seem to be a lot better than they were at picking up where they left off. Now here, we've got just a, a few minutes where the COP isn't particularly good. Still not too bad. So every time a heat pump starts, there's bound to be a little bit of inefficiency as the refrigerant sort of gets into the right place and works efficiently. And if we look at, look at stops and starts, then we would expect a little bit of a drop. But the effect we saw before with the cold start, so, sort of these two, in some cases, sort of cancel each other out. Now I'm going to show another example, just a, a simple one of a heat pump here cycling. And this, these are 40 minute cycles. So this is a quite a long duration. And it's worked at steady state here quite nicely with the flow temperature of 36. And the air temperature is rising up slightly. So it's a warmer period. And it's got to the threshold where at this point here, the flow temperature can't, it can't go any slower. So it's cycling on and off. Now, by using that COP comparator and by looking at the rise in temperature by a few degrees here, we would expect this COP of 4.4 to have risen up to 4.77. 
So you don't get hung up by the decimal points there because it is approximate. But what we're actually seeing is a COP of 4.55. So it's sort of 4.5% worse. So it's no big drop. And whilst it's nice to avoid, sometimes we just have to accept that that's, that's what it does. So now we come to some bad cycling. And here we've got a system. It's quite a large heat pump for the house in question, 16 kilowatts. And it, this little period here, there aren't many emitters on the, in circuit. So what we've got is various thermostats in rooms and various radiators and underfloor heating rooms all together. But it can work on radiators only, and that's what it's doing here. And there aren't enough radiators in circuit. So the flow temperature rises up quite quickly and then it turns off. Now, interestingly here, if we look at this period, it's exactly 10 minutes. Now, if it's cycling on temperatures, it's not going to be exactly 10 minutes. And what it turned out, this is actually the thermostat, which is a chrono pulsing type thermostat, which is causing this cycling, which is really not what is wanted, not what's wanted. But in this case, in fact, because there's only one zone on, because it's relatively big for what's, what it's being asked to do here, in fact, it can only run for about five minutes. If it ran a bit longer, what would happen is it would rise, the flow temperature would rise up more. It would go off more, so then should drop down more. But for this size of heat pump, it's inevitably, inevitably going to cycle. And if we look at what the heat pump is producing, in this case, it's fairly low, actually, up to 36 degrees. But the radiator itself is getting a considerably lower temperature. The mean temperature of the radiator is about 30. So that's a loss. So what, what could we do here? Well, a buffer tank would, would clearly help or making it such that it never has so few circuits open at any one time. Or arguably the heat pump is too big anyway. It's quite a difficult balance because, of course, you need enough heat to deal with the peak of winter. But you don't want something that's going to do spend a lot of the year doing this. Now, in this case, the system, I mean, it, it is quite complicated. There's five circulation pumps and actually quite difficult to set up and to know what's happening, partly due to its complexity. There's something nice about simpler systems. But on larger buildings with lots of rooms, it's likely to be fairly complicated. So here we have a 14 kilowatt heat pump, and this one day period is at minus three, so middle of winter. And you might expect it to be running more continuously, but it's doing a lot of cycling. And it really shows all the hallmarks of fitting a heat pump in place of a boiler without making many changes because it actually comes on at about quarter to seven in the morning. I'm not sure what time they get up, but that's quite late for a heat pump. And it's had all of this night time at minus three outside with no running at all. So it's got quite a bit of catching up to do. So inevitably the heating curve has been set quite high. It does hot water heating first thing. So there's nothing about this is set up particularly well. But after maybe an hour and a half of running, it starts cycling. Let's just have a look. Let's just zoom in on the cycling. And this is a one hour period. And we can see it's running, I think every 10 minutes, it's uh, turning on off six times an hour. And the flow temperature is ramping up to above 50 and dropping down to 32, which is a bit bizarre, really. And the flow, uh, the return temperature is not much above 30. So the actual temperature of the radiators will be some of them will be quite low they'll be uneven the effective area of the radius is unlikely to be being used properly here so looking back at the one day period this scale is kilowatts so when it was doing the hot water it was reaching above seven kilowatts with a cop of about two and then there's this period here where it's producing water about um 50 50 degrees Again, the input is about six kilowatts, quite a low COP. Now it's using nearly 50 kilowatt hours a day. And in part because the owners didn't want to spend so much on electricity, they have a wood stove and that's what they were frequently using. They've sort of turned it down badly. And of course it won't really cope. It would be much better to have a smaller heat pump here to run it a little bit more in, in the night so the house isn't so cold. They'd be able to turn the heating curve down 
not only that, of course, if the heat output is less, then the flow temperature won't rise up anything like as much, and they could achieve much better performance. Now, this is a really interesting graph from EcoForest, and it's showing the variation of COP due to compressor speed. This is the compressor speed here from 100% down to 15%, and the COP up here, obviously six being exceptionally good. And we can see that when the compressor's in mid-range, the COP is best, but at very low speeds, then the, then the COP drops off. Now, your heat pump on minimum speed may not be running down here because, of course, the manufacturers set the algorithms to stop at a certain condition or certain speed, and clearly this is, is to be avoided. And it would be probably better to cycle with medium cycle frequency than it would be to try and operate continuously down here. So why is this variation? Is it what we'd expect? Well, it is because at high speed, maximum speed, the pressure drops in the pipes will be greater. The heat exchanger, watts per square meter will be higher. There'll be more temperature differences. So you'd expect a lower energy efficiency here. And at very low speed, my understanding is electric motors aren't particularly good at low frequency. So I think it's the motor, electric motor side of things that's the main problem here. But also we're noticing at these conditions that refrigerant control can be a little bit variable or temperamental. So thank you, EcoForest, for sharing that. I like EcoForest because they, they share all the information you might need to know like this. So there's some thoughts on cycling. It's not a thing to avoid at all costs. It's nice to avoid if possible, but clearly with the current air source heat pumps, the problem is much much smaller than it used to be it's quite nice to try and design systems so they're unlikely to cycle so if you did find that useful and liked it please push the like button it might be helpful okay thank you goodbye